terrifying, terrifying and predictable things in Irish life is heart disease, the thought of heart disease. And the ultimate extension of the terror in people's minds is to wonder if they will need a heart transplant. I'm not talking about a bypass, I'm talking about a heart transplant. That's the ultimate horror. You might like to know that the cardiac unit in Dublin's Matter Hospital has performed 26 transplants, transplants in the last five years. And the man who leads that team is outstanding in his field. Would you welcome, please, Morris Nedigan. And Grand. And Grand, sir, and I hope I feel as well when I finish talking to you. Don't depend on it. Now, you're very welcome. Is it, is it in fact now becoming a fairly routine operation, Morris? Yes, indeed. Um, it's something that, as you know, developed in two epochs. Uh, it's almost 21 years ago, 22 years ago now, that Christian Barnard did the first in December 1967. And that went uh, very enthusiastically for about three or four years. And then it was found that the uh, professionals uh, were unable really to cope with the problems of a rejection of the implanted organs, uh, and two, that the infections um, that supervened when you suppress somebody's immune systems. And the two together led to really dismal results. So every, the thing that had started so enthusiastically mm. and so well mm. just faded away into nothing. Mm. And only about two units in the world kept going until uh, in the early 80s, this new uh, drug, cyclosporin, came on the market. Uh, interestingly enough, that was discovered by uh, a biologist from Sandoz, the, the company that are hoping to come into Cork Harbour, um, who was on holidays in Norway. And he saw a strange looking mould growing on a rock. And he looked at it and he said, that's a bit odd looking. And he scraped some of it up and took it back to Bala, where their factory was located, or their plant. And they started work on it to see, was it active against leprosy? And it didn't really work very well against leprosy. And then, really, serendipity uh, stepped in here because one of his colleagues was looking for a new immune drug. And it has revolutionized all transplantation, cardiac, because, liver, heart. Because what does this do? do it, it This suppresses your immune system that normally would reject, reject a foreign organ, be it a kidney, a liver, or a heart. But doesn't leave you open to other? Much less so. Much less so, I see. Much less so. so. in terms of cutting and stitching and hacking, to put it crudely, is it a routine operation? Is it oh, a very much so. It's a very much uh, an easier operation than many of the things we would do, say, in children, or even a bad coronary bypass in an adult. Mm. It's uh, if you can sew anything together at all, a heart transplant <laughs> is not one of the most difficult operations. <laughs> <laughs> mm. A bit of stitching and sew on, and you're right. there. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> Very good. Now, the great difficulty, of course, is is the donors that you're still having. We're still talking about it a lot, and you're having difficulty in persuading people to give hearts to give organs of yes. their loved ones, yes. yes. Where is the crux there, Morris? What the crux, I think, um, is worldwide. Uh, they reckon in the United States that they're getting about 10 to 15 percent of potential donors. And uh, the crux really arises in two levels. Uh, one, I think people are not aware of how much good can be done by making a donation. Uh, I mean, right now, you can help somebody recover their sight. You can help somebody uh, recover their kidney function. You can help somebody have a new liver, a new heart, uh, a new pancreas, new lungs. All these things are being used. But people aren't aware of this. And uh, they look on it still as something experimental. And well, the kidneys now have been going for a very long time with superb <coughs> success rates, and particularly the unit here in Ireland. Um, and the other thing is the very real thing that it's a very traumatic situation. Uh, it's usually a young person. The death is usually unexpected. Uh, the grief reaction is, is fierce. And it's very hard to expect people to think logically at the time. I mean, they're, they're wrapped up in their own grief and their own fear and their own upset. And it's very hard for them to get them to rise above that and to think beyond that to, to somebody else who might be helped. And even at times, the doctors, you know, you're reluctant to approach people who are in this dreadful situation. Now, the people who approach the relatives of, of deceased people are not the people who actually take the organs. They're no. the harvesters, they're yeah. called, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. Yes. So, so over one dead body, let's talk about it frankly, over one dead body, there could be harvesters taking heart, kidneys, liver, anything that's gone. 
frequently are. Frequently are. Yeah. And the great, the great balking point, apparently, is eyes, as I mentioned on the radio program recently. Yes. Some, and, uh, yeah. I, I think psychologically that's yeah. so. I think um, a lot of people feel it extremely difficult when somebody is dead if, if the eyes are taken. Uh, they somehow think, oh, God, that's not the same person. Yeah. Uh, and psychologically, there does seem to be an upset about eyes. But there is one thing about eyes that doesn't apply to the others. Uh, eyes can be harvested. It seems a terrible word to use, yes, doesn't it? it? Mm. Um, eyes can be taken from a cadaver. Mm. That's from a, somebody who's actually dead and whose heart has ceased to work. Whereas the others are taken uh, from patients who are brain dead, but whose circulation is still working. Now, that always raises a doubt in people's mind, yes. you know? They're yes. taking my bits and I'm not dead. That's right. Is that what it means? Yes, I mean, you're back to the sort of fears of yes. being buried alive in mm. the, the days in Paris when they used to bury you with a little bell uh, above the ground just in case you moved in the coffin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They had to stop that because the dogs running through the cemeteries and there were people being dug up all the time. Um, but it, it does raise this question. But the, the um, criteria used throughout the world, the Harvard criteria, are accepted pretty well everywhere. Yes. And uh, there are additional safeguards. Here in Dublin now, the team that are uh, going to approach the, the relatives, uh, they must cure it with the coroner. Mm. Uh, and this again brings in another safeguard uh, into the line. Mm. Um, and certainly I think one could be reassured that it, it is inconceivable that somebody would be transplanted who was not authentically brain dead. And so in the operating theatre then you take out the old heart, it sounds so simple, and the new heart is in what? It's in a box. And it's in a uh, plastic bag packed with crushed ice. Just that? Just that. And it has been, uh, it's had a special solution poured through its coronary arteries to paralyse its cells so they're not working and using up its energy. Um, and then it's brought in, it's just cut out of the bag and it's handed to whoever's, whichever of the surgeons uh, be it Mr. Wood or myself or Mr. Luke or Ms. McGovern, whoever happens to be doing the transplant or happens to be there on the, mm. on the evening. Mm. So with the old heart then, you sort of stip all the appendages all the way around, is that it? All the with, the, um, with the old heart, we just we leave the back of it where all the veins drain in. The veins come in from the lungs and the veins come in from the body. So you leave the back wall of the heart uh, and the veins that drain into it. You don't have to take away those. So you just leave the shell, the back shell of the heart. And then the two main vessels that come out of the heart, the aorta which pumps, goes around to the body, and the pulmonary artery which goes to the lungs. And then you lift out the rest and, and hand it out. And that usually goes to pathology to have a look at it and see what was it that uh, caused it to, to cease yeah. to function. Although we've usually got a pretty good idea. Of course, of course. Yeah. All right. Mm. Would you like to see it being done? No, I don't mean we're going to have a heart transplant here. <laughs> No, but I want to show you a piece of tape. I want to warn you about this piece of tape. It was made a week last Wednesday in the matter with Mr. Nelligan operating. And it is not up to our usual technical quality because it's a kind of a home movie, but it's perfectly clear. It is perfectly clear, I assure you. But that is this because you don't get a rehearsal and like a lighting plan for a heart transplant. You get an hour's notice and that's it and you go. So forgive any technical defects in this. If you are in any way squeamish about looking at blood and gore, what you're going to see is an open chest, a heart coming out, and a heart going in. It lasts for about three minutes. If you want to go away and make yourself a cup of tea, or have a strong drink, or close your eyes and think about your smoking habits, this is the time to do it. I'll tell you when it's all over. I'm warning you, it's, it's fairly explicit. Roll it there, Roisin, please. Remember, this is a heart transplant which happened a week on Wednesday in the matter. Have a look at it. I have to tell you that the noises in the background is just general chat that's going on. And these boys tell jokes while this is going on. Is that true? Marcus? Oh, absolutely yeah, true, Gay. We're, we're very light-hearted um, people. Yeah. Um, at, at times, it gets deadly serious. Yes. But most of the time, uh, it's better to have a relaxed atmosphere in the theatre. Yes. Um, and, and that we contrive. It, it's very much, this is very much a team. We can't function well if the people are on the heart-lung machine. Yes. We can't function above all without our, our magnificent nurses. Yes, that's the uh, old heart pumping away there. That's the old heart working away. And what we're doing is we're connecting it onto the heart-lung machine. Because when we take out the heart, the patient will be living on the machine. Yes. And this is where timing comes in. Because if your new heart is coming from Cork and uh, there's a bit of fog out or there's a bit of traffic on the road, uh, you may be sitting there with no heart inside and just 
working on the machine and wondering where the hell he's got to. Um, and and this, this, this does arise. But you can, in fact, you could go on. The heart has been taken out there, and you just leave this sack of the, the what we call the pericardium that's, that's behind. The new heart that's the new out heart the being washed in its ice. And that, that uh, had, in fact, come up from Cork. From Cork? From Cork. Mm. A good Cork heart. Mm. As I told you now, this is not up to our normal, this, this photography is not up to our normal technical standard. It, but we wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like. Do I hear bodies dropping, fainting there in the background somewhere? No, we're yeah. just trying to localise there where to put the stitches in. You, you always sort of ponder it, you put it in sort of backwards. Yes. And uh, it's not a good idea to actually w wind up sewing it in backwards. Sewing it in backwards? Mm. Would, would that affect it? Doesn't work too well. Doesn't work too well. <laughs> I notice, Dennis, you're not watching this. <laughs> you're staying out of the light on this. I'm being very, very brave. I'm, I'm, I've, I've seen this before. How about that? It's, it's a miraculous thing. Stay where you are. Though. This is Arthur Moynihan, ladies and gentlemen. Arthur Moynihan, and that's his wife, Jane. How do you do, Jane? Me, Arthur, you, Jane. And Arthur had his transplant in February of this year. When did you get the bang? I got the bang uh, just around Christmas time. It was a sudden and quick bang. So I was only ill, really, for a very short time. Um, and I was told by, uh, by Mr. Nelligan's colleague, Mr. Wood, that I had about four months to live. And uh, at the time, and the only possibility was a transplant. Believe me, that was a great shock. I mean, if I didn't need one, I needed one after that. <clears throat> Um, because my, my memory of it too was Christian Bernard and, and uh, headlines on the paper that patient lasts six days or something. But anyway, um, I was very fortunate in the sense that uh, there hadn't been any donors for some months. And I was at, uh, had been discharged from hospital after this attack of virus on my heart. I had a short time to live and I was at home. Mind you, feeling quite confident for some reason. I felt it would work out all right, you know. And um, after 10 days, lo and behold, the telephone rang. And it was the Matter Hospital. And they said, uh, would you like to sit down, uh, Arthur? And I said, yes. And uh, they said, we'd like you to come up to the hospital as soon as you can. But don't crash in the way up. Maybe come up within an hour. <clears throat> We've got heart from Cork, <clears throat> as it turned out. So um, Jane was with me. Um, <clears throat> we got into the car, and we, we drove off. You know, It was a daylight today. It was a grey, cold, wet daylight what, today. What do you talk about, Arthur, on the way to the matter? Do you know, I, I, looking back on it, I'll tell you, we talked about I had to pay my credit card account, because if I didn't, I would be in trouble. That was <laughs> one thing. Um, I had to cancel two... You'd be in <laughs> trouble. I'd be in trouble. I'd be, that's what was on my mind. You know, I was, <laughs> but actually, uh, that really, they were the sort of practical things you know, that I had to do. And I remember, of course, very well now, driving up uh, to the matter and a great sort of sense of conflict. On the one hand, there was this hope, this possibility that I wasn't going to die. That was the first time that that became a possibility. You know? and that would, but on the other hand, there was this question of the transplant. You know? So that was quite a conflict. But all in all, I was quite confident, really, until we pulled up outside the matter and uh, there were these great big steps yes. into the matter, Necklace Street. So I just about made it up to the top of the steps and uh, was brought up to a, a room upstairs. And what I remember well about it really is that <coughs> there was a great deal of excitement. Mr. Nelligan was there, Mr. Wood was there. Uh, when I saw them, actually, I, I was calm enough, you know. Uh, the sisters, the nurses were there, and they're all so professional and so skilled. And, but I felt that I wasn't just any patient coming in. There was a sense of occasion, you know. Now, for me, I, again, I say there was this air of kind of confidence, of this calm, this, this I don't know, somehow I knew it was going to be all right. You work, you work, I know you work for CTT. Did mm. you kiss each other goodbye or, or say cheerio or no, good luck? No, or? no, nothing like that. It was, uh, it was a little bit like, you know, when the rugby team were going to go on tomorrow, it was kind of hurrah, hurrah, off you go, chief for go, in is, and do is it. Is this how you remember it, Jane? Or? It is actually the same yes. game, yeah, with absolute total confidence. I never dawned on me anything was going to go wrong. I just felt, Amazing. this just felt right, you know, Amazing. off you go. So we didn't make a big drama out of it. We just... Sore? No, I'll tell you the funny thing, actually. When I, the last thing I remember before <coughs> I woke up again was this lady with a, must have been a nurse or a doctor with, you know, the gown and thing. 
and great big brown eyes, lovely brown eyes, pools of eyes, you know. And I remember looking at her, I remember being totally, and if anything had happened, I mean, if I had died, I'd have been the one most surprised, you know, I wouldn't have expected that at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, the nurses there are so good, really, for example, they showed me where I would wake up in a sort of bubble, a high-tech bubble. And in spite of the fact that this building is very old and, and, and uh, you know, from the outside looks a bit antique and so on, actually it's a very high-tech, the St. Celia's Corridor is very high-tech, and the nurses are very well trained. So I woke up in this plastic sort of bubble and there were all sorts of things. And um, I was there for, on the third day, you know, they started taking things out, one down. And on the third day, they had me cycling a bicycle. On the fifth day, a little bicycle that doesn't move, right? On the fifth day, they had me cycling a big bicycle. Um, and after that, I was walking around and I was home within three weeks and I was working three months later. And, you and you know, feel great. I feel great, thank God, I do. I feel great and I feel nothing, essentially, but enormous gratitude to my yes. donor, to God, yeah. to, to everybody. Sure. That's I bet you do. Story. I bet you do, boy. <laughs> you see, you're not so matter-of-fact about it. Yeah. When you talk about it, you do, you do get filled up. You do get Patrick Clune from Rathdrum, Rathdrum, County Wicklow, farmer, 50. Your transplant, August 87, Patrick. 87, 25th 87. of August, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were very ill. How ill yes, were well, you? Yes, well, it was a little bit different to Arthur's insofar as that I was sick for a much longer time. It was 11 years. Yeah. And uh, had been very active, but anyhow, to cut a long story short, I was coming and going out of uh, a nursing home in Vincent's for 11 years. Uh, I would have seen every season come and go, you know, on and off. Uh, it was on all the floors. Yeah. <laughs> you might say nearly on all the beds, but anyhow. It went on for 11 years and uh, gradually going down the hill. And uh, eventually it got to the stage that uh, I wasn't able to do anything. I used to be uh, able to do a few jobs around the house, do little jobs. I was always very active being a farmer. And doing little jobs around the house, but I eventually got to the stage I wasn't able to do that, even to go down to bed. I hadn't the energy to throw back the quilt. I would just throw myself in the bed. It was that week. But um, eventually got to the stage that I came up <coughs> on the 5th of June, 87. Uh, I had an appointment with Dr. Moore for the 12th of June. And I said I'd have to see him before that. I knew a transplant was in the offing. He had told me that way back then, perhaps. And I said, no, I come up, I want a transplant. If I uh, if I'm looking up. So I came up and I remember I was always very brave about it, I suppose, but it shocked me very much. He says, Pat, he says, we won't beat about the push. We'll get you in, he says. And medically, he says, there's nothing more we can do for you. That shook me more than anything else. You're going to die. I'm going to die if somebody doesn't come forward. That shook me. <clears throat> I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget it in the Black Rock Clinic. That's, that's where I met him. <coughs> and um, you know, I came in on the following day on Saturday uh, and it came along. 13 weeks I waited. And eventually on the, on the 11 o'clock on the Tuesday, the 25th, in the nursing home in Vincent's that was, a little nurse came along and she said, you have to be in the Black Rock Clinic this evening. And I jumped up and uh, I was delighted, absolutely delighted. I'll never forget it. And um, I was getting ready, I had to get a bath. I was just after getting my wife down, I had sent me up a new pair of pajamas. I had put them on me, and, uh, and I said, you have to take them off. If there's shower, I was after showering, you'll have to shower again, and all the rest of it. But uh, I, just a little story, a nice little story. Uh, Dr. Moore was my physician, and he rang, he says, I wish you the best of luck, Pat. He had worked extremely hard to keep me alive a transplant could take place. I um, must give him full marks for that. Wonderful man. But uh, he rang me. He said, Pat, I wish you the very best of luck. I went out to the nurse station. And I said, well, doctor, if something does go very badly wrong, I want to thank you all for what you've done for me. I'll never forget, as, you know, I felt brave, but nevertheless, had he wavered in his, what he'd said, he could have shaken me. But I'll never forget what he said, and I hope he's watching that at least he'll see my gratefulness to him. He said, 
Patty says, nothing will go wrong. He said it emphatically, nothing will go wrong. I'll be talking to you in two or three days' time. That was wonderful. It was just wonderful to hear him say that <coughs> because it reinforced my confidence. My so off I went anyhow and uh, um, I had my transplant that, that night. And uh, I remember it. Uh, I remember just you know going in and saying goodbye to them and that. And um, I felt full confidence. I, we had played extremely hard. I resigned myself to die if that was the way it was going to be. I had no, absolutely no fear at this all, was, thank this God. This was a hereditary uh, heart disease. Apparently it was, yes. Had, because your brother Billy is beside you. Hello, true. Billy. I'm and he, you <coughs> had the same complaint, Billy. That's uh, correct. Yeah. Okay, yes. And you're waiting for a heart. I'm awaiting a heart transplant. And, and uh, are you in pain now, or are you Not really, tired? Gay. Or? Well, I'm very weak, really, Gay. Weak. Yes, yes, I can absolutely do nothing. Yes. And unfortunately, when I'm feeling reasonably well, I would uh, tend to want to do something and get back into my old self again. Yeah. But I'm suddenly made aware yeah. that I'm unable to do anything really. And you're farming as well in I am. Rathdrum. Yes. And how how much younger than Pat are you? You're, you're well, I'm 47. 47. You're 50 now, yes. so you yes. had your job done when 48. you were 48, mm. and and you're just waiting. And, and you but don't know the day nor the hour. No, I was called on one occasion, Kay, mm. and uh, it turned out <coughs> it didn't go through. There was some little wrong technical heart. problem. Wrong heart. Yes. Mm. And what and do you it do? It was you quite get, an experience. You just get dressed again and come home, is that it? That's correct. God, <coughs> must be very disappointed. Dreadful. Yes. But Dreadful. Um, I, I would just like to say oh. that um, I'm very thankful, really, to be so well as I am. Mm. And I think a lot of the credit is due to the kindness mm. of people, the consideration of people towards me since I became ill. Mm. And I must say that. Do you remember how bad Pat looked before his operation? Indeed, I'll never you, forget it. I saw, it's a very, very bad photograph, but you look yes. skin and bone. You, yes. really were, you yes. were about to die, there's no doubt about yes. it. Yes. Now, the extraordinary thing is that, that this is Pat Clune and, and his wife, mm -hmm. Dimna, and Billy, and, and his wife, Marina. Hello, Marina, how do you do? Okay. Sorry, Dimna, I didn't say hello to you. Now, the point is that Pat has in him the heart of a young boy of 22 who was killed in, a, in an accident. And that boy's parents are there. They are Liam and Eileen MacDonald from Tinnehealy County Wicklow. Hello, how are you? Look, that's Eileen. How are you? How are you, sir? Liam. He was 22, was he? That's right. Motorbike, was it? Motorbike, yes. Just got a call one night and said he was... That's right. Yeah. And who approached you about, um, about taking the, the heart? We offered ourselves, like... You offered, did He you? already had a kidney donor card. Had he, indeed? Yes. Mm. Fine young fellow, was he? Yes. Healthy young? He was, yes. yes. How long had, been, had he been riding motorbikes? Well, from the time he was 17. Mm. What, what, what did he hit, or what hit him? Do you he know? Just, he, he hit a signpost, like, and hit it. It was only about a mile from home. Yeah. And um, you knew, what, what, what else of his did you give? You uh, his ki yes, and his kidneys, kidneys. and eyes. <coughs> and his eyes. Yeah, and liver. And liver. Yes. The whole lot. Yes. And then, uh, when did you find out that Pat had your son's heart. What was his name? Pat. Pat. Sorry, yeah. Pat I see. <laughs> how, how, when did you discover that this Pat had Pat's heart? Well, we, we, um, there was a word of a heart transplant on the paper the next day, like, yeah. and we concluded that it was him, you know? Yeah. And then you met. Did you, did you ask well, to meet Pat? What happened, Pat? I, yeah. I knew of uh, of McDonald's. Yes. They're only 16 miles from it, but I didn't know McDonald's beforehand. But um, I said, we'll wait. And there was a write-up on our local paper, the club people, you. about me. And uh, I had mentioned it there that I knew of the people and that in my own time I would contact them. So I thought it was up an opportune time at, uh, at the anniversary. That, so I took it on myself. I wrote to McDonald's and uh, suggested that if they were interested, I would very much like to meet them. Mm. And I had a lovely letter back from Eileen, I'll never forget. And, uh, Yes, saying yes, that would be lovely, and we would love to meet you. So we, so we went up on the next day of the anniversary, I think, the day after it. But uh, the little chapel, and right beside where the boy was killed, actually, a little chapel, and so we said, we'd, and the boy is buried there in the graveyard, and we said we'd bring up a wreath and put it on the grave, on, just on the way up. And we call in, say, a prayer in the, in the chapel, and we happened to meet a little priest, a uh, young priest, I should say, their father, brothers. And he just briefed us. We had never met McDonald's before. And we proceeded up and met him there. They met us there outside their house. 
and it was wonderful to meet him and that was it. I felt, I felt gay, I want to say this, I felt that I had received everything and had given nothing. And the fate that existed in that home, I will never forget. You know, they had lost their son and I was delighted to be alive. That they had lost their lovely son and uh, I had gained everything. And I felt, you know, to say thank you was totally inadequate, you know. What do you but, say? Uh, I, I remember, I, I, Liam said, I remember Liam said, he said, Pat, I want you to remember one thing, he says. And never, ever think, never, as long as you live, that you owe us anything, he says. Because we gave that, and we have just delighted to see how well you are. And uh, it's a hell of a thing. that was it. Well done. Just thinking, you're probably the healthiest one here, Pat. <laughs> healthiest one here. You've you've no idea, Arthur, whose whose heart you. No, have, no, no. And um, my thoughts about that are to wait at least a year. You know. Yes. Uh, yes. Of course, I can find out, and I know people who know. And the coordinator, uh, Betty McCluskey, in the Mount <coughs> Hospital, she knows me, and she knows the donor. So it's easy to find out. And I thought at the end of one year that I will, but. This question you mentioned to me there that, uh, that I fill up, yes, I, I fill up in this sense. This gratitude thing is a very, very strong feeling. And particularly gay, if, as I do, like I know people when I was getting better, people who were in bed, people who were dying, people, I know them by name, people who have since died, people who are waiting, people who are waiting for the same fortune that I've had. And that's a strong, a stronger feeling to have about things. So it is a question, as Ms. Nelligan said, about the need for donors. And, the need for medical commitment. So, so important. Mm, thank you, Arthur. Yeah. Well, Morris, that must be an inspiring story, as much. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's it, it, very much so, Gay. It's and difficult it, not to be It's taken. also the bits that, that we don't hear or that maybe we don't listen to because yeah. we're too busy uh, trying to organise the nuts and bolts of the procedure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the bravery of the people who, who give and who take is, is really beyond description. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I would feel in a similar circumstance. And everybody takes it so, uh, so deeply, so thoughtfully. Uh, and the sacrifice that people make in giving, I mean, it, it really is all about love. Mm -hmm. That even in your, in your uh, most tragic moments that you can think of others beyond yourself. It really is a remarkable That's thing. That's what it is about. It's about yes. love. That's right. And then the amazing thing is that once Arthur was done, once Patrick was done, the recovery is so quick. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You had him on a bike. Yeah. Well, essentially, you're putting in a new battery. A new battery. Um, you connect the wires. You connect the wires, <laughs> and off you go. I mean, it, it, it really is a very simple thing. And then all the things that have been backing up and uh, all the organs that have been malfunctioning, the kidneys, the liver, you put in a new blood supply and everything clears up dramatically. Mm. Uh, and we've had people now out of hospital within one week of a heart transplant. And Patrick is a, a terrifically healthy-looking man, isn't he? Right, yes. Fine, healthy, yes. He was always very man. tough, though, Patrick. Yes, know. yes, but if you saw the photograph, by golly, if you saw the photograph oh. a few weeks before the... I remember yeah, him yeah. well, yes. yes. Really, he was a goner. Well, he didn't look too good. No, yeah. no. Do you want me to take a call, Dennis? You do? You know you don't. Line four, all right. I'll try line four, but I'm not, not into it. Yes, line four. Uh, hello, Gay? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, question from Mr. Nelligan, yes, please. Sir. Can rejected, transplanted organs be reused? No. Um, no, the, the, the rejection process will damage an organ beyond repair. Patients who reject an organ, however, can be retransplanted successfully. Patients who've been, who, who rejected have rejected an, an organ, can you can, be you can take it out and put in another one. Try it again. If you can get one. That must yeah. be awful, awful. <laughs> Haven't tried to do that Are you happy yet? with that, sir? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, well done. That was short and sweet. That's the sort of phone calls we like. Do you, have, do you laugh at these things, Morris? Do you, do you laugh? Do you... Um, sometimes, yes. What was the funniest thing that ever happened to you in relation to a heart transplant? Well, in relation to a heart transplant, um, I, I guess I have a black sense of humour. It occurred mm. afterwards. We, we had a most meticulous, reserved uh, registrar from Bahrain. He, he was a marvellous uh, young man, a brilliant surgeon, um, very quiet. I never once heard him swear in all the nearly four years he spent with us. And he's the kind of person you'd willingly let operate upon yourself. And he would work all the hours that God sent. He was a devout Muslim. 
Devout. De oh, very devout. And uh, one evening, we these things always happen at night, by the way, for reasons that aren't altogether clear to me. But we were leaving the hospital at seven o'clock in the morning, having leaving the matter, having worked all through. And it was Freddie Wood and myself and uh, Habib Tarif, as his name was. We walked out the front door and we just stood on the steps for a minute. And for the first time I ever heard Habib swear, and he said, oh, 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 Jesus Christ, he said. And he looked down at his car, and somebody thoughtfully, while he was in during the night, working away, had taken the four wheels off his car, and he was up, <laughs> up on bricks outside the main door of the sure. Matter Hospital. You are yeah. joking. But we wondered that his, his swearing was done uh, in the Christian mood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Indeed, very handy. For and the, the wheels were gone. The all, four. Were all four. All four. Somebody had worked equally diligently outside, <laughs> and we were. Yeah. And, and did he laugh? He didn't you, laugh for a while. Laughed. We you laughed. laughed. We you laughed. laughed. Yeah. Laugh. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Oh mean. Right, number three. Yes, line three. Yes, I would like to ask Surgeon Elligan yes. how confident he is that he himself will never die of a heart attack, and if. He is confident that he won't die of a heart attack. What prompts this confidence? Um, this question is in two parts. <laughs> Use one side of the page only. I, re I rely on my, my parents' longevity, and I may, that may well be false optimism. Um, if I thought about it, given what I do and what my colleagues do every day of the week, I don't think we'd function at all. Uh, I'm not confident, but I just hope and pray it won't happen to me. I see. So, so your experience... So your experience with all these heart transplants is not uh, in, in, giving you an inbuilt advantage over the rest of us? Oh, I don't think so. It's just that I believe in keeping away from doctors so as they don't find out. <laughs> and what about the diet and all that? Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Line one. Line one. All right. Line one. Yes, line one. Uh, hello, Gay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to pay a big tribute there to Mr. Nilligan yes. and just tell you that... Uh, Back in the late 70s, uh, my daughter, Nessa, had to have open heart surgery in the Crumlin Hospital. And uh, it was a fairly major operation, obviously, with two holes in the heart and two faulty valves. And the operation was performed early in the morning by Mr. Nelligan. And my wife and I were visiting uh, the hospital that night, and we were leaving sometime after midnight. In fact, it might have been near 1 o'clock in the morning. And as we were going down the corridor, we bumped into Mr. Nelligan on his way back from some function. He was in his dress suit, and on his way home, he was popping in to see how Nessa was progressing. And we thought this was tremendous dedication on that man's part. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, darling. Just, just time for one more, because I have to let Dr. Nelligan go. Yes. Um, on the film, Dr. Nelligan, you were able to keep the patient alive, you said, with a heart machine. How long could somebody stay alive when the heart and lung machine? And what would happen if, when you open the plastic bag, the second heart, uh, that you weren't happy with it? You know, could the patient survive um, any length of time at all on the machine? That's one of our nightmares, that that would happen, that you'd actually have taken out a heart and you'd find you couldn't use the other one. But what happens there is you will ask them. They, they're in contact by telephone all the time with the coordinator, Betty McCluskey, a marvellous person. Uh, and Betty will relay the messages backwards and forwards. And if I'm gone for the heart, I will telephone back to Freddie Wood or he'll telephone back to me and will say, this is okay, we can use this. And then you wait for them to come back. You can go with what we're using there, you can go six, seven, eight hours without a heart pumping. The machine will do the heart and lungs work for you in, in that time. And there are even machines now that will go 24, 48 hours to try and keep people alive until a, a, a heart becomes available. And that's what they use the mechanical hearts for now, the Jarvik hearts that they were using a few years ago. They're used as a bridge to transplantation. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. Um, one last one. Uh, talk about your wife's, uh, your mother's longevity and so on. Um, do, do you smoke? Um, I don't smoke cigarettes. I smoke the occasional cigar game. Occasional cigar. Do you take a drink? Yes, I do. What do you drink? Anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd drink a pint of beer or a pint of stout or and whiskey. some red wine. Whiskey? Uh, seldom. Seldom. I probably should, though. I think oh, that's yes. probably whiskey better than the pints. Oh, yeah. whiskey. I was waiting for you to say whiskey so that it's all right yeah. to, to give us all, all clearance. Yes, all right, one more. Yes, sorry. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Elegant, yeah. in relation to potential donors, uh, given the great scarcity that there must be for heart, hearts available, um, are you very particular about the type of donor 
And uh, do you, for example, find a situation where a heart or a patient uh, who's going to give a heart is not suitable, that they're too old or they have had a disease or, or whatever? Yes, frequently, and it's, it's more critical for us than it is for the kidneys. Because once you pass 40 in men and 45 in women, you've put the risks that the donor himself will have uh, coronary arterial disease become very real, and we can't use them. But the funny thing we've been finding is that heart disease in men, coronary arterial disease in particular, is eight times more prevalent in men than women in Ireland. And we've been finding a lot of men in their middle years, and they tend to be big. They tend to be 68, 70 to 80 kilograms weight. And the people who are coming for transplantation are very often, say, women who've unfortunately had uh, bleeds into their brain, are young men who come off motorbikes and who are very young and small and slight. And we've found that we're getting a lot of hearts that are simply too small for the group of recipients who we have waiting for them. But that's going to change uh, shortly when we start to transplant lungs and heart lungs. Uh, we'll find that all donors of every size uh, can be used by somebody who desperately needs them. Thank you for joining us on The Late Show. Um, at, at most, most heartwarming, and I'm glad you said it, is all to do with love, that, that situation down there in the audience. And may the Lord long leave you your hands and your brains and everything you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.